Okay, so ready. I was going to talk about. Is it recording? Ready. Yeah, it's recording. Okay. So today I was going to talk about um, code control, um, version control, semantic commits, uh, and um, so the uh, code review process. Um, so you guys have heard done your first retrospective of, of what we did this week, um, and uh, as from, from the bit that I heard. Um, making progress and making sure you're, you're, you're making progress is one of the challenges. Um, and I heard a little bit about uh, discussion there on, on JIRA and different workflows. Um, so we can also look at how, how JIRA does workflows and, and how we can potentially actually do, create uh, different workflows. So um, one of the things that, that um, I would like to know about is, is also kind of what background a bunch of these the students have, and if I try and make this small, I don't know if I can um, make it or with the Discord window small enough so that it just shows you guys. Um, I, 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 like Sky. I'm already recording them as well. Okay, yeah, yeah but uh, I, I'm thinking I was going to ask them some questions um, about um, automatic um, like semantic commits and webhooks and um, version control and get. So what kind of the level of experience in, in the audience on um, version control and webhooks? So have you guys been using webhooks? Do you know what webhooks are? No? Who knows? Yeah, Marcus knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll start from the beginning and we'll see how, we'll see how we go. Um, okay, so um, one of the things that, that we get from, from version control and from controlling our source code is that we have a process by which instead of just constantly changing code and, and writing code and overwriting each other's work. Um, we look at a way of, of trying to, to resolve um, that sharing of code between each other. Uh, and as a secondary, we also look at um, automating uh, how we deal with, with uh, the processes around code. So for example, when you, when you commit something, um, what you get is you get a uh, um, uh, you, you get an event that occurs. Now that event can be linked automatically to follow-on events. Right? So so in um, get built in deep in the system are um, a selection of hooks. So there are pre-commit hooks, there are post-commit hooks, there are pre-push hooks. Um, there are pre-stage hooks, there are post-stage hooks, um, there, are, there are lots and lots of, of basically events that you can listen for. On those events, you can attach scripts and full code to them, um, which then allows you to change what happens when you are editing your code. Now, um, one of the simplest things that um, CVS and SDM uh, was the idea of saying, oh, okay, we're, we're going to commit something to a repository and we want you to then take that repository and immediately upload it to a web server when we give you a specific tag, right? So, so when I commit and I write the word release in my tag, it will automatically push that to my web server. And so the idea is that on the event, you have a retro expression search, you would search for the word release at the beginning of the commit message, and then you would release the code at that point. Um, now, the, 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 uh, that kind of very bespoke one-off solution to something became more and more standardized, and we started having ways of writing commit messages to trigger other behavior and to connect my code commits and my code updates 
with other parts of the system. Um, and so that's when we start talking about smart commits. And we're going to talk about smart commits, we're going to talk about the difference between semantic commits and temporal commits, and some of the automated systems um, that we can have around them. So our assumption is that you're familiar with Git um, or version control in general. So um, how many are not familiar with version control in general? I mean, I, 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 are there any hands up with people who are not familiar? No, everyone is familiar. Fantastic. One <laughs> of my assumptions works. <laughs> so, um, I also am assuming you have a project that um, will have issues that you want to solve. Hopefully that's true. Um, you want to record the information at the time it is created. Um, I don't know how good your memories are, but um, when I do something and I try and think back six weeks as to why I did that thing, sometimes it's hard to remember. So I like to kind of try and force myself to record my decisions when I make them so that I don't have to try and work out why on earth I included that um, for loop or what's that chick doing or why is that here at all? Um, so the recording why you've done something and when you do it is usually much easier. Um, and we're going to require you to log progress, uh, and often in projects, logging progress has become very important, particularly if you're um, having an external client and, they, and you want to build it. Um, and uh, also one of my assumptions is that good logs create easier debugging. Um, given that you know that 90% of the time you're going to spend as, as a professional is going to be debugging code that you've written, um, or that someone else has written, even this. Um, making things easier to debug makes you a more efficient developer. Right? So it's not how efficiently you can generate code that is the key, it's how efficiently you can debug code that has been generated that makes you a, a better developer. Um, so, get inversion control. Um, I'm assuming you understand that, that uh, get uses change sets, not versions. So although it's kind of almost a misnomer for the version control, because it doesn't technically use versions of um, files, it actually uses chain set, the change of sets related to files. So um, it kind of builds up the deltas uh, and then orders those to recreate the file as it is now. Um, now Depending on, on how strict you are with your um, versioning system, uh, there are uh, some companies uh, who have a very strict rule of saying you are not allowed to touch code unless there is a, a raised issue related to that code. If no one's raised an issue, you shouldn't be touching it. Right? Which is basically a don't screw around with things because they might break. Um, and the other part of that is, is if you are going to be changing something in the code base, then there should be some process around it where some, some people have thought about what you're going to do and it's been agreed that you're going to do that. Right? So this is particularly important when, when you have basically joint ownership, when there are four or five of you who are working together on a piece of code. Um, you can't just unilaterally decide, oh, I'm going to refact the system because I want an entity component system here rather than a, a, a standard object hierarchy. And um, you just decide to go and refactor everything. And the next morning, people come in and have no idea what the code does anymore. Um, that's, that's not polite. Um, it's a very cruel thing to do to your teammates. Um, I have seen developers who do this sort of thing. Um, most people don't like working with those developers. But, the idea is that every change should have a reason. Um, and if we're working in a professional environment, those reasons should be tracked with an issue. There should be some an issue that's brain raised, it should be allocated to someone. Potentially, if you're working in a professional environment, it would have been allocated time. That's the scoping thing. Uh, one of the benefits of allocating time when you first raise the issue is that you can then reflect on did it take as long as I thought? If you just start fixing things, 
very easy to forget how long it's been since you started trying to fix that problem, right? Because you think, come in, you're doing some work, you see a bug, you start fixing it, and you start fixing it, and you, you know, you go away, hey, hey, lunch, come back in, you, you do some other stuff, then you go back to the bug, and you do some other stuff, you go back to the bug, and you go away, you have dinner, you come back, you, you sit in the evening, you have your coat up while you watch a movie, tinker, watch a movie, tinker, watch a movie, come in the next day, tinker, tinker. Now, how long have you been spending trying to fix that bug? And how long did you think it was going to take you when you first started? The problem is, when you first started, you probably think, oh, it'll, it'll just be like 20 minutes. Right? And then a day later, you're going, oh, no, no, it's still only 20 minutes away. Um, and so you get it fixed, and you go, oh, yeah, no, the bug was only 20 minutes. Even if it took you four or five hours, or potentially a full day with thinking time. Um, so that you fool yourself and think, yes, but the fix was look, only took me 20 minutes to code. But it took me five hours to work out how to fix the code. So that bug didn't take 20 minutes to fix. It took five hours to fix. And unless you're willing to write down at the beginning your estimation, record all the hours you've been working on it, you won't get any better at estimation. So that's partly why we are forcing you and, and requiring you to have issues and time a lot is so you can get better at that. Um, also, if you've been using Git and you've been using um, commit messages, commit messages need to be short. They need to be, you know, five or six words, um, maybe ten words at max. Um, that's very hard to describe all of the complexity of what you've been doing and why you've been doing it. And so as soon as an issue, as soon as your commit message gets more than ten words, you, it will better to put that explanation into a commit message, into an issue message somewhere, and then attach that issue to your commit message. Um, now, uh, given that you know Git, you know there's a staging and committing and a push, um, and that staging only um, changes, uh, yeah, so so in the staging phase, if you were using something like um, uh, source tree, uh, you can very easily stage chosen parts of the file uh, and you choose files, and you can choose parts of those files to stage. So with the commit, if you are going down this, each commit message is connected to an issue. If you've done more than one thing, and admittedly I do this too, you, you're coding, you see something, you go, oh, I'll just do that, you do that thing, and come back and you keep going, and now it's time to commit. If you commit all of the work you've done with one commit message, there are multiple issues you've seen. And so if you create one commit message and just say, oh, solves hash three, hash four, hash eight, hash nine, every line of code that is new will be tagged with all of those issues. And so it's very hard to work out which bit of code fits what problem. Right? This is particularly relevant when I come back to a problem and I go, oh, okay, so, um, oh, I've got this problem again. Which bits of code fixed it last time? And I go in there and go, oh, it's like half of this file, and it's seven other issues. Ah, right? So it, it's about, sort of, in, in my analogy, I often talk about painting one of those plastic models that you use to glue together and then paint. If you took the plastic models and you glued them together and then tried to paint it, it was really hard. So you're supposed to do the really boring thing of painting all the bits of plastic on your plastic model, waiting for them to dry, and then gluing them together. Right? But as kids, you want to put your plastic plane together because you want to see the plane, and then you try and get out your flying brush and paint it. That's actually the worst process. What we want you to do is upfront, when you are putting the code into the repository, you make it easier for yourself later by using semantic, meaningful commits, rather than just temporal or time-based commits. I'm sure a lot of you are used to the idea of using get at the end of the day. Right? Coding, coding, coding. I want to go home. I'm either on this machine, and I want to like, share what I've done, so I'll just commit, and my commit message will be end of day, I commit everything, and I push it up, and that's my commit message. I go home, and then I can, can pull everything down, and other people can pull down what I was doing. Um, it's all terribly broken, and it's halfway through a solution, 
and it doesn't sell everything. And so I, I did, okay, well, I'll just put it on a branch, or branch out, kind of, you know, afternoon branch, and I'll just save it there so that it doesn't destroy main, and that would be great, because now I've got this, this branch that is, is doing the job. Now, um, yeah, those are not particularly valuable commits, right? Um, they're not actually helping the, the project move forward. They're just you using commit messages as a way of storing current sort of temporary state. Um, so it's much better if you're going to do that, that you actually, A, as I said, you make a branch, you commit your non-working code in that branch as a temporary commit, and then you're going to overwrite it and get rid of that temporary commit because you don't want that commit to stay in the history because it's very rare that someone else will go, oh, I found a bug, and I know Simon was thinking about that on Tuesday afternoon, so that's where it will be, and go looking for the Tuesday afternoon commit. Um, that's, that's not how other people think, right? And we're working with other people, and so your commit messages need to be meaningful. Now, as I said, we use um, commit hooks. Um, the, in Jira, um, we can actually use uh, quite complex smart commits. And as you can see down here, we have, have an example of my, in Jira, you use the name of the project and the number of the issues. So for example, uh, Glide, I was looking at their issues and they've got um, the, the um, Glide tracking um, or the tracking Glide thing. Um, that has Glide dash one and Glide dash two are the special word you use at the beginning of your commit message to say, this commit message is associated with that issue. JIRA also does regular expression checking on the rest of your commit message. And so it regular expression looks for hash time and then does a processing of, um, in this case, four hours. It could be four minutes, um, it could be 30 minutes, a 1D for one day, um, so it, had, it, it does processing on the string immediately after the hash time. It also has a hash comment um, where you can actually put a comment in. Um, and you can also create your own regular expression checking on that tag. Right? You can actually say, well, okay, I, I also want it to check for the word Womble because when I go hash Womble, I want that to mean that I'm going to commit it to the Wimbledon directory and the Wombles will deal with it or something, right? So it's like you can you can have your own tricks. Um, GitHub, Bitbucket, um, uh, GitLab all also have local issue trackers built into them now and they all use a simplified hash number as a way of binding a commit message to the local issue in the um, in the Git repository. Right? So that's it's a bit like how Twitter came up with hashtags. Um, it's a kind of user-defined, not part of the, the Git standard, but it's something that everybody's now adopted. Um, Jira was doing this earlier than the other ones, and so it doesn't use the hash number, it uses the project name, or yeah, the short name, dash number. Um, it also allows you to have a repository that is working across multiple projects in Jira, and multiple projects to be looking at one repository, right? Where it, so, so it has a many-to-many relate Jira to repositories, whereas the, the GitHub and the, the GitLab and Bitbucket all are issues on that repository, and so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Right? So, so Jira has more power to do that. Um, okay, so if we look at the, these principles, so the principle is document what you are doing. Separate code changes um, at the time that you are changing code. Uh, you can also do this interactively in uh, Git Bash or in um, Git. You can actually do an interactive staging, and it will go through and ask you which changes to include in this stage. Right, so you actually can see the diff on each file, each diff, each change, and decide whether or not to add that to this current stage or not. Um, the principle that time is not as important as meaning, because when you come back and look at this, we don't see when you did it, we see what you did, why you did it, not when. 
And that's very much like when we're asking to write about your thesis and write reports about code. We don't want you to write a narrative. We don't want you to write, I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this, and then I did this. Because we don't really care about the timing of things. We care about the logical relationships. And that's what this move is in semantic is, is to look for the logical relationships between the issues you have, the code you're writing. Um, also, additional time spent during creation will save you time on maintenance. Um, this is kind of, you know, it is usually much better to do preventative healthcare than reactive healthcare. You want to uh, you want to be careful with what you eat because once you've got diabetes, you've got a lifetime of, of management there, right? So, so what you want to do is you want to spend time now rather than spend time later. Um, and maintenance and, and debugging is going to be the largest block of time you spend. So these are these are principles we want you to kind of take up, and we want you to, to be smart about the way you commit things. Now, there are various um, visualization tools. Once you are doing smart commits, you can actually do a whole bunch of interesting things. Uh, you can look at who's committing messages, when they're committing messages how much of the repository is committed by each person. Um, uh, you can look at the, the get stats also will do this. Um, so Get Inspector is a, is a project for um, uh, I think Gothenburg. Um, and it, it does also complexity of the code you're committing and, and a whole bunch of interesting statistics. And because it's annotated, when you annotate the code, it makes it easier to find out what your code is doing. Okay, so Jira issue tracking. So um, a bunch of you have started using Jira, or well, one one group guy has already got Jira logins um, set up. So we are requiring all of them to use Jira, I believe. Yes. Yeah. You're all. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, nodding. All going to be forced to use Jira. Um, now in the Jira, as it says, um, at the moment I think we have bug feature, task story, and epic. Don't think we have the improvement um, issue. What we can do is we and Jira is customizable, so we can actually tag any issue. Um, we can change the, the issue tags, right? We can actually change all of those, uh, and we can create different um, issue types. Uh, we also have when you create an issue, it automatically will get a number. <coughs> glide that would be like glide one, uh, um, and at the moment. I think the default is this. We lost sound. Story points. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. You're back. Okay. Um, so, are we getting them to use story points or hours? Up to them. Up to them. Do they know the difference? Who, who, do, we, do you guys know the difference between story points and hours? There's at least one knot. Yeah, there's no knots. Shaky, it's like some shaky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one of the things that we talk about with story points is um, the idea that that uh, and and actually, uh, Marish and I and, and Runa and the, the the other developer and other lecturers when we did um, the Odin project together, we actually did some estimation of how long some things would take. Um, and and I remember one of the tasks that we were asked to estimate. Um, independently, Marish and I, I think I put down four hours, and Marish took down four and a half hours. And the next lowest estimate was 14 hours, <laughs> and the average of the rest was 20 hours. So Marish and I had both kind of estimated something at about the same amount of time for us to do, and the other um, lecturers had, had estimated taking about five times longer. So 20 hours of work, so three days, and we were estimating half of that. Um, and, you know, if it did only take my ration half a day, and, and, and partly the other, the other lecturers were estimating the additional length of time because um, it was using particular features of um, web programming which they hadn't used before, and so they, would, they were estimating, well, I'm going to have to learn this tool and I'm going to have to implement this thing, whereas my ration and I had actually, I think, like the week before, both been doing this, and so we had actually kind of got a fairly accurate assessment of our own ability to solve that particular task that we've just done. Um, now, if we just estimate hours, 
do you go, well, okay, we'll take the average and say, well, you know, these people think it'll be four hours, these people think it'll be 20 hours, so 24 divided by two, so that's going to be 12 hours. So let's just estimate that it would take 12 hours. Um, but then if we do it in four hours, does that mean we're supposed to wait and do nothing for next, the next day? And if someone does take 20 hours to do it, does that mean they're now behind in their work even though they've turned up and worked hard all day? Um, that, that doesn't really make sense. And so what we do is instead of recording those hours, we try and estimate the complexity of the task that we're in. And then we allow um, developers who are very skilled to have what's called a higher velocity, the rate at which you generate complexity, the rate at which you solve story points might be much higher for some of the developers than others. And that's acceptable. This, we we realise that we're, all, we're not identical. So some of us will be able to generate um, solutions to problems much faster than others. This is normal, this is fine, that's how life is. And so rather than saying a mythical man hour um, for a task, we look at the, the complexity of tasks that the person is, is completing and say, well, you know, that's only vaguely connected to two hours, right? We, we know that on average our team does one point of complexity each hour, or each, each um, day, and so if it's a four point complexity, it's going to be four days. If it's a half point of complexity, it's half. Um, and you don't estimate anything less than half a day, partly because if you're estimating something will take less than half a day to do, you shouldn't be wasting your time writing up the issue and filling all the details in and writing a big kind of report and getting it into the, the planning and, and having all of that work for something that's only going to take you two hours to do. Right? So you should build your tasks a little bit bigger than that because that's too small a task. Um, you also don't want your task to be like, oh, this task will take me three months. So I'm only going to have one issue and it's right thesis. And I'm going to issue track that. That I started at the beginning of January, I ended in June, yay, one issue, and 100% done on the last day. So <laughs> you're going down charge of the flat line until the last day. Um, that's not a good <laughs> issue model. Right? So what we want is we want a way of, of estimating. Now, um, we have a question? What, yeah. Uh, What's the question? Yeah, uh, how do you document and estimate when you're doing what you know? Regarding those, so in in Jira, um, it actually directly has a, an estimate, and you can put that estimate in um, in the Jira issue, uh, and so that and so it's in, it sets up a, a bar of how far through. You can set up both story and hours. Um, I don't know if we've got your project set to story or hours. We actually in Jira, you can set it to whether it's going to estimate on story or hours. If you're estimating on story points, um, and if you're using story points, you can also add uh, an estimate of the number of hours as well as a statement on the story points. Generally, it doesn't change the story points. What you do is you put in the hours, and you can see the hours going up and up and up and up, and you get two graphs. You burn down chart of story points and a, a kind of burn, a, a, a pile up of hours that have been being done, right? So you can either, uh, and Depending on how you view it and how you graphs, you can either have those both going down or one going up, going down, so you can see the, the, the rates of change. So, so it's actually a setting in here as to whether you use story points or hours. But when you set it up, you can write in those estimates. Now, um, what I was going to do, and I had on my other machine. Uh, uh, another question, uh, Simon. Oh yeah, Simon's really here. Uh, I was saying at the beginning that uh, what the student needed to do was to sum up the um, available resources, the many hours there were, but if there are story points, obviously the team needs to try to assess how many story points the team has to be able to do in one uh, sprint. Yes, yes, so, so um, generally what, um, I know I think this is, with Marish, your brother was using this, is, is um, a story point per half day, Mm. And so basically, you, you're initially you're going to estimate that um, 
your hours are relatively similar. And so you can think of a story point as four hours worth of work. Uh, and so that's an initial way of thinking about it. Um, and as you get better at understanding complexity versus hours of work, you can then start, start kind of refining that to say, well, I know this is the same complexity as this other task. I think it's going to take me shorter length of time, but I don't know there's, there's a, a risk associated with it. So I'm going to give it more points because of the risk associated because it could take me two days, it might take me half an hour, um, and that level of risk means that I'm going to give it more story points rather than try an estimated number of hours. It means, you know, as you average those story points out over a, over a full week, some of those, the high risk ones which took a short length of time, you got through fast, and some of them you didn't, and so over the week, you end up doing your um, uh, eight, um, no, ten story points, right? Um, so yeah, so that so it, it's more at first kind of guessing that about half a day is the story. Yeah, that, uh, that, that works as long as the velocities are constant, but if you have different velocities in the team, then of course you have to receive a lot of the captain becomes when you make the initial assessment so how much how many story points the team can Yeah. Yeah, and, and when you first start, you won't know what you've lost, right? Because, um, well, you know, you're just still learning. <laughs> it's the, <laughs> the challenge of, of kind of trying to estimate something you've never done before is is, is very hard. Um, and so the more you do it, the better. Um, have you introduced Pan Poker? Nope. No. Um, how many of these students understand the Pan Poker? Uh, six. Yeah, well, most. Most have done planning poker. Excellent. Um, so I, so I, I actually had a, an online planning poker session we, we could do if we needed to discuss planning poker. Basically, planning poker is this idea that, that um, by making estimates of things um, and by all trying to estimate something, you can then kind of I'll negotiate to a shared understanding of how complex or how big a task is, right? And so you can do planning focus on hours, or you can do it with story points, it's entirely up to you. Um, but it's it's a, hopefully a way of trying to resolve some of that, that issue, is is trying to get people to share an opinion about how long something will go. Now, um, as far as I'm aware, you guys have been sitting there for an hour now? Uh, about right, yes. Yep. So we should probably give everybody a break so they can stand up and walk around, and then I can continue my lecture in 10 minutes. Does that make sense? Yes, we can do that. Yeah. Okay, so um, we'll take a, uh, a break, and you guys can go and take a wee uh, walk around and stretch your arms and, and, and chat the, the progress you've been making, uh, and we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Okay.